on page seven in the forward. Now, I know this is kind of unusual to deal with this, but, uh, but there are some things in uh, the introductory material that, that are in this book uh, by Brother Stroop. J. Ridley Stroop uh, is the author of this book. He was, he is, or was a noted American psychologist, well-known, famous in his day, in the early half, the first half of the 20th century. Uh, he was a professor at uh, David Lipscomb, at that time David Lipscomb College, now Lipscomb University. He is uh, well-known, most well-known, uh, for his work in the, in the, in the area of, of cognitive uh, recognition and uh, developed a, a pattern or a series of studies which bears his name, the Stroop Effect. In fact, you can Google the Stroop Effect, and there's a Wikipedia page, and there are a, a, a number of pages, uh, uh, websites that are dedicated or include Stroop's work in that area. So he's a man uh, who was a, a great uh, thinker and a great uh, uh, student of the human mind. And yet, at the same time, he was also a tremendous Bible student. And, of course, that's something that's lacking in, in today's society, that those, uh, those that, that are in those particular fields have bought into every kind of foolish theory uh, and, 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 and counsel people in ways that are just absolutely anti-biblical. And so Brother Stroop uh, did us a tremendous service when he wrote this book. I believe it was uh, first uh, printed in 1949, it was a, a post-war book, and there's some things in the introduction that we'll talk about uh, that pertain to uh, post-war attitudes that were also common uh, in the late 1800s in the post-Civil War uh, 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 ideas that were shared, uh, for example, by uh, David Lipscomb uh, himself. And so uh, when we look at some of these things, but look on, on page seven in that opening paragraph, it says, in about the seventh line down, it says, The writer holds the conviction that the only gateway through which a person may escape from the thraldom of his own religious error is a personal interest in the need of his own soul and a recognition that the real need is to truly sit at Jesus' feet and hear his word. And so I thought about that statement, and, I, and, and it made me, it brought to me the, the idea and the truth that truth may be known and properly understood. Truth may be known and properly understood. Now, a vast number of people in American society and in most Western <coughs> societies reject that premise. Uh, there, is a, there is a rejection of absolute truth. Absolute objective truth that most people do not believe uh, that absolute objective truth exists. And thus, uh, uh, having embraced that particular ideology, every man, in essence, is his own God. In other words, every man is his, is his own source of morality. Every man is his own source of what is right and wrong. And there is a tremendous uh, number of problems that arise from that. Um, you know, if, if there is no God, for example, and there is no truth, there is no standard of morality. No man can say with absolute certainty that any one thing is true or false, good or bad, right or wrong. Because we have seen through the course of even the history of the 20th century, the, the, the atrocities that were uh, uh, committed uh, by men uh, in, uh, in, in mass numbers. For example, uh, you know, Hitler exterminated somewhere between 6 and 10 million people uh, in his creation, his desire to rid uh, Europe uh, or Germany of all her so-called problem sources and create a master race. Uh, Stalin, uh, Stalin killed about 20 million of his own people uh, through the course of his uh, uh, reign of terror. Um, uh, uh, Mao Zedong, the, the Chinese, uh, Chinese communist leader uh, in the post-war era, uh, people of his own of his own people uh, in his uh, desire to to to, uh, to gain power, and then we can look at even in smaller in smaller uh, sections or in smaller uh, uh, numbers, uh, men such as uh, Idi Amin in Uganda in the seventies. 
Uh, some of the genocides of Rwanda where you know, a, a, a half a million people in a small country, a half a million people uh, would be slaughtered. You know, Saddam Hussein, uh, right now, uh, Bashar al-Assad al -Assad of Syria, uh, you, know, you know, practicing uh, genocide and, and all types of atrocities. If there is no God and there is no truth, there is absolutely no principle upon which one can stand and oppose these things. And so we, we want to begin with the premise, you know, when we start thinking about why do people not see the Bible alike, one thing is, is that people have to, first of all, agree that there is a body of truth and that that truth can be known. And then down at the bottom of that same paragraph, it, it, on the right-hand side, about six, seven lines down, it says, in a very real sense, each one must save himself from this crooked generation. That's from the sermon on uh, the day of Pentecost. And with many other words, he both testified and exhorted, saying, save yourselves from this word there, the, the tense of, of the word there is literally be saved. Be saved. It's a passive, it's a passive imperative in, in the sense that you can't save yourself, but it's incumbent upon you to pursue salvation and to receive it. And so we want to make sure we understand those principles uh, uh, correctly. We, you know, when Peter said save yourself, he didn't mean that man could do anything to save his own soul. But what he did mean was it's incumbent upon every man individually to seek and receive the salvation that God uh, has offered. And that that salvation has to be worked out with fear and trembling, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Now I love this next line in the next paragraph. This, is, this book is simply the transcription of a number of lectures that Stroop gave uh, during this period of time. As, as are a lot of our sermon outline, or our sermon books, uh, brother by, by, by Brother Woods, Brother Nichols, uh, they're simply transcriptions of sermons that were already preached. Says the purpose of these lectures in dealing with the question of religious differences is not to place the blame for the differences upon any individual or church group. And that is a, that is a, a great statement to make at the outset. We're not, in, we're, we're not in the business of assigning blame in these matters. All right? We're in the business of trying to find out what the source of the problem is and then dealing, <coughs> dealing with the source of the problem as opposed to the symptoms of the problem. And he'll deal with that. Uh, about page uh, 17, somewhere on page 17 to 20, uh, as we make our way through this introductory material. And so we want to make sure that when we approach these matters of why people don't see the Bible, like it's not our place to blame people. It's our place to try to come to a proper understanding of what the Bible says uh, and, and not to, not to uh, uh, mark or belittle uh, any particular individual. Note also on page 8, on page 8, in the middle of the page, on the right-hand side, halfway down that, that primary paragraph, beginning with the word observe, it says, observe that no effort is made to establish any point by quoting human authority. In other words, as we proceed through, as we proceed through this book, we're going to find that the author never points to any human authority in an, in an, in an attempt to establish truth or facts. Um, it's a lot like, if, and I know you do recall, it, it, it's a lot like the attitude that Randall had uh, in our study of, uh, of muscle and a shovel. You know, where did Randall begin every discussion? You know, the Bible says, the Bible says. And uh, there is no appeal to human authority. Um, you know, I was, you know, uh, before Bryant and Shelby married, uh, and y'all know I go to bed early. And at 9 o'clock, I was about ready to go to bed, but Bryant was interested in asking me some religious questions. Well, obviously, I didn't put him off. And so for the next three hours, from 9 o'clock till midnight, he asked question after question after question. And I made it by, I made to begin every response with this statement, the Bible says in, and I give book, chapter, and verse, and then provide what the verse itself said or 
a, a summary of that verse. In other words, every question that was asked, the response was, the Bible says in, book, chapter, and verse. And then tell what the book, chapter, and verse says. And this went on for three hours about all different types of, of religious uh, uh, subjects and, and questions. All right? And, uh, and we got getting to wind down. And, and, you know, and I know one time he said, well, we'll just have to agree to disagree. I said, no, we won't. <laughs> We're not going to agree to disagree. I said, I, I told you what the Bible said. And, and, you know, and we got to the end of the discussion. And I was way past time for me to go to bed. And uh, I said, I said, Brian, I said, I want you to understand one thing. I want you to take note of one thing about this, these last three hours. I said, in every single question that you asked me in the last three, I said, in all of your statements, one time did you appeal to the Bible as the source of your authority? And he paused for a minute. And he thought about it and he said, you know, you're right. You're right. And I hope it made an impression on him. You know, and, and maybe that, you know, maybe, you know, maybe that will at some point, you know, to, you know, you know, the Bible says, you know, not what I was raised to believe, no, not what my parents believe, or, you know, not what, you know, what I've been told or, or whatever. The Bible, the Bible says. And so the author at the outset says, we're not going to appeal to human authority for anything uh, in matters of establishing truth. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and beginning in verse 1, he said, When I came to you, I did not come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom. You know, my speech was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. You know, Paul, you know, Paul readily admitted, readily admitted, but what he did also say was, I did not try to, to frame cleverly disguised arguments or cleverly crafted uh, arguments. I simply came and preached the simple gospel of Christ. It says that your faith should not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so as we move forward through this material, we want, first of all, ourselves, we want ourselves to rest in the confidence of the power of the Word of God and not in some type of cleverly devised uh, argument or some, you know, some silly syllogism. You know, we want the power, uh, you know, we want to we rest in the truth. You know, we want to drive our state, build our foundation in the truth of the Scriptures. But then at the same time, be able to communicate those truths to others to help them come to a proper conclusion about what the Bible says about whatever a matter is under consideration. Now, in on page nine, the orientation of the question. In other words, why, you know, why this question, and, and what do we mean by it? Why do people not see the Bible alive? Um, by the way. I did a Google search of that phrase. Why do people not see the Bible alive? And for about the first hundred results, there were basically two options. One was a Google result trying to sell this book. Amazon, Aid Books, you know, some used bookstore. I mean, so, so a bunch of the results were just simply somebody has this book for sale because I typed the title of the book. The other 50 results, all websites of the Churches of Christ. All websites of the Churches of Christ. You know what that tells me? It tells me that nobody else is interested in answering that question. They don't think about that question. You know, think, about, think about how often we talk about coming to a proper understanding of the Bible and people believing and, and teaching and practicing the same thing. You know, how often does that come up in our Bible classes and in, and in the sermons and in our, our gospel meetings and, and, and in our uh, discussions? And yet it doesn't show up anywhere. For the most part, it doesn't show up. Either. Nobody else seems to be concerned with this question, except members of the churches of Christ. 
I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Just this past week, a friend of mine who is a member of a denomination made a post on his Facebook page about treating people right because you reap what you sow. All right? In other words, if you do good, good will come back around to you. And most of us believe that, right? I mean, it doesn't always work immediately, but most of us believe that if we do good, good's going to come back around for us. All right? And Jesus even taught that. You know, give and it shall be given to you. You know, good measure, shaken, pressed down, shall, be, you know, shall men give into your bosom. And, and he taught in a number of other places. But then he cited Luke 8 and verse 11. The seed is the word of God. He said, if we'll plant good seed in dealing with other people, he said, we'll reap good things based on the seed that we plant. Well, I just couldn't let that one go. I couldn't let that one go. You know, he's the one that, he's the one that mentioned Luke 8 and verse 11. So I said, and here was my statement. Let's take the picture of the seed a little further. If the seed is the word of God, then wherever that seed is planted, it will produce the exact same thing everywhere it's planted. Therefore, if the seed is the word of God, and it is, and because seed will reproduce the same thing everywhere it's sown, why is there so much religious division in the world today? And that's where I ended it. And you know what? He clicked like on it. He clicked like on it. Which I guess that's good, but I mean, but you see the point? People really aren't interested in why there's so much religious division. They just accept it as a fact because that's the way in the world that we live in, that's the way it's always been. And people are taught that not only is that the way that it's always been, that's the way it ought to be. That everybody ought to find a place that, that suits them and, and, and makes them comfortable and helps them to, to serve the Lord the way that they think is best. And there's not one bit of scripture anywhere to support that. But yet that's what everyone is taught. Why do people not see the Bible alike? Most people just aren't interested in answering that question. On ChristianCourier.com, article number 225, Wayne Jackson makes this statement, and I quote, There is no such thing as two people who understand the Bible differently. Let's sink in. There is no such thing as two people who understand the Bible differently. Because if they have arrived at different conclusions, they both can't be right. Or both. Yeah, either, either person A is wrong and person B is right. Or person A is right and person B is wrong. Or person A and B are wrong. But person A and B cannot both be right if they arrive at different conclusions about what the Bible teaches. And you know that statement <coughs> sticks with me. It sticks with me. So then I refined my Google search as to why, uh, uh, why do people see the Bible differently? Why do people see the Bible differently? And I got a few hits, not a whole lot, but I found one that I found very helpful, and I wrote these down. Four reasons, four reasons why people see the Bible or come to different conclusions about the Bible. Number one, they have different attitudes about the Bible. They have different attitudes about the Bible. For example, uh, they believe that the uh, somebody might believe the Bible is above human comprehension. Some people believe that the Bible is above human comprehension. 
Number two, God never intended the Bible to be understood in such a way that everybody agreed on it. I mean, that's a common, that's a very common attitude about the Bible. Or that it's not necessary for people to come to the same conclusion. But, but, but that's pretty insightful, isn't it? The attitude that we have about the Bible is going to determine how we uh, approach the Bible. In what, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. It's going, how we approach the Bible in matters of study and matters of conclusions if we determine to draw in. But our attitude, uh, our, our, uh, our what's the, the conclusion is going to be determined by the approach that we take. I'll give you. I'll give you. A, a, I'll give you an example right now. That's in the news right now. Has been since the 14th of February. Does the Second Amendment give me the right to own guns or not? It does. It does. It does. You know the right. Of the, you know the right of the people to to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. All right. And then you can go back and you can read what the Founding Fathers said about it. And it ain't got nothing to do with hunting. <laughs> you know, have, keeping them bearing arms ain't got a thing in the world to do with hunting. In fact, Thomas Jefferson said, and I quote, he said this in 1824, three decades after the, the, the Constitution was ratified. It is a man's right and duty to be armed at all times. To be armed at all times. All right? Now, we got a whole bunch of people now that say, you don't have a right to have a gun. Don't have a right to have a gun. All right? And there was a poll came out, and it's not scientific, all right? So don't, don't take too much stock in it. Uh, there's a, a, a L-U-G-O-V, ugov.com or ugov.org. And they, they, they don't really call you. You have to go on their site and answer the questions. So there's no scientific real scientific background to it. But here's, here's what the people that responded to that poll question, 50% who identify with a particular uh, political party agreed that all guns ought to be confiscated. 50% of the people that identify with a particular political party in this country that responded to that poll said all guns ought to be confiscated. All of them. So when people, start, when people start having a different approach to the U.S. Constitution, they start coming to different conclusions, don't they? Isn't that right? And so the same, the same thing applies to the Bible. You remember, and you all may remember, remember when our document and it evolves and all that? The essence of that is the Constitution doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. In other words, what it meant when they wrote it and what they intended when they wrote it, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Worlds change. So therefore, we can interpret the Constitution any way we want in light of, in light of whatever we think is best. All right? Well, that's, same, that's the same approach people take about the Bible, right? It's written 2,000 years ago, and the world's changed in the last 2,000 years. So therefore, we don't have to, you know, we would be foolish to look at the Bible today in the way that people looked at it 2,000 years ago. All right, so one reason that people come to different conclusions about the Bible is because of their approach to the Bible, different attitudes about it. Uh, number two, influence of parents. Influence of parents determines people's attitude toward the Bible. And what I found interesting about that was there was another statement that was made in connection with that is, is that, is that Children tend toward replicating their parents' behavior and attitudes in matters of religion, politics, etc., manner of living, even though they all say that what their parents do is antiquated. In other words, it's old fashioned. You know, every kid says what his parent, what his, you know, what his dad or his mom or her mom does is old-fashioned and it's out of date. And yet, as a general rule, they still imitate, they still imitate those, those things. Does that make sense to you? 
They say one thing that's out of date, but they still end up doing basically the, exactly as they were influenced. And so in matters of religion, that would also, that would also be true. The influence of their parents. Number three, human creeds. Human creeds. Creed, C-R-E-E-D, creed. You know, a, a book of discipline, a, a prayer book, catechism, um, you know, uh, articles, you know, articles of, uh, of doctrine, you know, things, things such as that. Man's Sir? Man's influence. Yeah, man, yeah, what man, you know, books that man has written. You know, for example, you know, there's probably, outside of, outside of the Catholic hierarchy, uh, John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, probably the most influential, non-inspired document of the last 500 years. I mean, you find Cal you find Calvin's influence everywhere. All right? <coughs> and so, and so, all these human creeds, uh, you know, the Westminster Confession of Faith, which basically is a Calvinistic doc uh, document, all right? the Westminster Confession of Faith. So, human creeds uh, are a reason that people arrive at different conclusions. And then last is this. Different approaches to study. Now remember I said the first thing, our attitude about the Bible is going to determine our approach to the study of the Bible. Alright? And there were two things in particular. One was trying to find whatever is not trying to find what is specifically forbidden so that I can do everything else. You know, a lot of people take the Bible and, and if they can't find if they can't find a course of action expressly forbidden by the Bible, then therefore God didn't say anything about it, so therefore I can do it. Now, do people do that? You better believe it. I was involved in a discussion again online about instrumental music, and that was the first thing I got. Not one word in the Bible in the New Testament expressly forbids instrumental music and worship. Right. Now, the guy that gave me this list, but I got, I got this list from, is not even a member of the church. Now, this is just a guy who got a different conclusion. So one is, people are looking for what is specifically forbidden in order to justify half of what they already believe or want to do. They want to go to the Bible to justify what they believe, what they already believe, or what they want to do. Now, that reminds me, there was a fellow by the name of, uh, I believe it was Aldous Huxley, not Thomas Huxley, but Aldous Huxley, uh, who was one, a well-known infidel and atheist. And Huxley at least was honest in his infidelity. And he said this, he said, we did not want to believe in God, therefore we went searching for reasons not to believe in God, and because we were looking for them, we found them. And then he went on to say, we found that religion inhibited us in the free exercise of our individual expression, particularly sexual freedom. In other words, he didn't want any type of moral moorings holding him back from doing what he wanted to do. And, and, and he was speaking for a generation of people who decided they didn't they didn't like the restrictions that God placed on them. So therefore, rather than trying to justify themselves using the Bible, let's just chuck the whole thing and say God doesn't exist. God, we don't even have to fool with the Bible. Because we've cut the legs out from under the Bible because now we say God doesn't exist. And so the approach to the Bible, the approach to the Bible uh, is determined by our attitude toward the Bible. So there's page uh, on page 9. Now, uh, I want to look on page 10. Have we so we're getting we're on past 10, 10 after. All right, on page 10, in the middle of the, middle of the document, uh, six lines down. Some have spent much time in bemoaning the lack of church unity. It being considered the source of serious handicaps to religious progress. In other words, the reason we're not doing as much as we ought to is because there's not unity. Now, if we had unity, we could do a lot more. And that is true. That is true. 
But this thought has given rise to varied activities. Some people have spent the major part of their time given to this matter in an effort to place the blame for the lack of religious unity, while others, and some have been so anxious about the matter and being able to restore unity of thought, have concentrated their efforts upon restoring unity of form. We can't get people to believe and think the same way, which is the only real unity that exists, right? The only unity that exists is when people believe the same thing, think the same thing. You know, perfect, as Paul would say, perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. But because people have realized that they can't get others to agree in the way they think, then they create this pseudo-unity, a form of unity. For example, uh, uh, back right after I got here, there was a thing going on called March for Jesus. March for Jesus. And people from all religious groups would get together in, in small towns across America and march down Main Street to show how unified they were. And even had Sander paraded out in front of them. And that was on Saturday. But where were they on Sunday? All went separate ways. All went their separate ways. When they dismissed that assembly, they all went their separate ways. But they wanted to give the form or the appearance of unity. It's like prayer day. Prayer day. I got it written down right there. National Day of Prayer. You know, like at the city hall or, or at the high school where they have one called See You at the Pole. Where they meet at the flagpole. You know, and everybody gets together. All right? So in other words, we can't get everybody to, to think alike and do the same thing. So we'll create this loose confederation of, of people and we'll call it unity. But it's really not unity. We allow ourselves to be fooled and to be fooled that the form of unity is unity in reality. All right, Lord willing, next Sunday we'll pick we'll pick up right there on page ten.